good morning. Following on from last week, this great message. Absolutely love it. About God putting his super on our natural. And we looked at Gideon and God sending an angel and, and the angel, you know, giving him the command, God is with you, reassuring him. And, uh, and you know, Gideon coming out with all the reasons why he can't do this and he can't do that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, but God's saying, just go anyway, because you're a mighty warrior. And this, that, and the other, I, I reminded us of what who we are in Christ and how God sees us. Remember the jigsaw where God's got the box lid and he knows us intimately and he knows he, he comes to us from perfection and he draws us into that perfection and uh, he convicts us to, to repent of things in our lives, even as Christians, to say that that's, that's no good for you or you can't take that where I'm, where I'm leading you, where you're going, you don't need that. Sometimes God has got to work on our internal life because it affects the way that we're going eternally. And, uh, you know, things like uh, temperament and things like anger or resentment to self-pity, things like this have just, we've got to somehow overcome them. Uh, well, it's not somehow, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, by the power of the Spirit, we should put to death the works of the flesh. And, and we can do you know, you, we can overcome. We are more than conquerors, like I was saying last week. But, you know, read that story of, of Gideon in Judges chapter 6, 7 and 8. And you'll see that even though he were faced with 135,000 uh, trained soldiers, he only had 32,000. God whittled Gideon's army down to, uh, to 300. 300 against 135,000. And they didn't even have... They, they, they weren't even using weapons at one point. They were they had a, a a lamp and a trumpet, and they smashed this like kind of oil lamp and blew a trumpet, and God caused a disturbance in the camp where all the Midianites started to kill each other, because it was they fought in the night and they just they got spooked and they slaughtered each other. You know when God begins to move, you think how can three hundred people put to flight and and and, and overcome an army of one hundred thirty five thousand. How can that be? I'll tell you, it can't be done by human logic, by figuring it out and doing the maths. It's by faith that they did it. And Gideon's commended in Hebrews chapter 11 with, with the uh, all the famous kind of guys that, that are written about there for having faith in God. And I want us to be that kind of people. The, the reason these stories are written in the Old Testament is so that we can learn from them and then we can emulate that. And so... Do read that story. It is absolutely fantastic. And God gave, gave uh, uh, a man, a Midianite, a dream of a barley loaf, I think it was, rolling down a hill and flattening all the tents of the Midianites. And, and, and Gideon and some of his men overheard it. And, uh, and, and they overheard the guys in the camp talking, saying, this can be nothing else except uh, Gideon. And he's going to come and destroy us. It was just really interesting how God worked through a dream that he put into somebody's mind. And so I want to encourage you, God's ways are not our ways. You know, God covered Egypt with frogs. <laughs> Egypt a superpower, keeping Israel under the heel. And part of God rescuing uh, uh, Israel from Egypt was sending a plague of frogs, sending a plague of flies. Goodness me. These, these weapons of mass destruction and, and not the ones that we equate with that kind of uh, thing. You know, it's a, such a colossal thing to do and God use frogs. Why? Because he's an absolute genius. And so I want, I want to encourage you to have faith in this invisible God who's got invisible resources that you and I can't see, but we take them by faith and we use God's promises in his word. But we've got to get on to some of that stuff. And so we looked at... Uh, you know, the, the the righteous will live by faith. I'll go from faith to faith last week. And um, you living by faith doesn't mean packing your job. And I think I said that last week. I'm going sitting on a park bench feeding the pigeons, having nothing else to do. Or God told me to pack my job in. No, oh, no. Everything we have and everything we do, we get, put it into God's hand. And we walk by faith with what God has given us. And we allow God to add or to increase what we do, to put his super on our natural. And some things he'll tell us to stop doing because that the, the sell-by date on what, what we're doing has gone. 
I, I worked in a factory. I worked in lots of factories in Darwin. Couldn't keep a job down. I was always drunk, but I'm bored. But here's the thing. On my last job, I stayed in for a good few years. I think it was about three years, maybe four years. And I stayed there and, uh, and I saved up. I, I became a Christian whilst I was in that job. But there came a time where God called me out and he used the scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah 52, verse 11. And it says this, depart, depart, come out from there, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But my servant will not leave in haste or take flight for the God of Israel will go before him and be his rear guard. And God used that scripture to tell me to come out. In other words, the days of the factory for Dave Shore have gone. I've got something else for you to do. And so I moved on from that. And, and then I went to Bible college, then I moved on from that. We set up a, a, an evangelistic uh, um, charity where we did a lot of schools work and street work and town-wide tent missions and working with all denominational churches. And there came a time after 12 years that God says, move on from that. And I've come and I've, I've started to, I've moved to York, you know, again, setting up my own church 15 years ago, uh, 16 years, maybe even 17 years ago. I don't know, it's something like that anyway. But the point is moving on and, and you know, you move on from, from faith to faith. And, you know, I, I'm called to reach the whole world. I'm, I, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna reach as many nations as possible. Uh, at least, at least a hundred, if I can. But um, by God's help, that's what I'm believing for. And so we want to, I think we usually leave this till the end, but why not be led by the Holy Spirit when you're preaching? <laughs> Global, the mission, making disciples, planting churches and reaching cities. That planting churches is about planting communities. Communities of faith. Where they, it's not just community like you join a club. This, no, there's purpose in this. We're about Jesus's purpose on earth. And often people want to be with us because because they want to hang out with good, decent people, and we are. And people of faith and people of energy and positive people. But it's more than that. And you can, you can belong before you believe. And that's good. But we're on mission, unashamedly. And our common denominator is we have Jesus as Lord and Jesus as our King and his word as our guide. So let's move on to some of these principles that I want to bring to us. Remember, God is your source and your supply. And, you know, hold on lightly to your job because when God tells you to move, the first thing that will happen is you'll be frightened that, well, where's the money going to come from? And you know then that you're learning. You're just beginning to learn about having, you might have faith in other areas of your life, but you're learning then to have faith for finances. And we do deal with that uh, a lot in global. So God is your source and your supply. So moving from faith to faith is a real key. When you and I ask, where are all the miracles? Like, like they were in Acts of the Apostles where 3,000 people became Christians in one day. In another chapter, it says, and 5,000 men were added to their number. You're like, oh, that would be fantastic. Um, but when we're asking, where are the miracles? We're asking, is God real? We're asking, is God really there? And we're asking, what's the blockage that's stopping all these miracles from happening? And so often, this is what I find, so often people, people of faith, are not living by faith in God. They have given their lives to him, but they live by the logic and the principles of this world, rather than by faith in the promises that God has given to us in the Bible. These people have not developed the faith. In fact, they've been using somebody else's faith. Someone else has been doing all the praying and all the believing for them. They constantly need someone to exhort and encourage them to step out in faith or make the good decisions based on God's word rather than the prevailing culture or the feelings like, oh, it just felt good, so I did it. You're like, no, don't do that. Don't go off your feelings. We're led by faith. We walk by faith, I should say. And it's not wrong initially that you that you live by somebody else's faith and you, you take a piggyback, you give them, you, you know, you, 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 you use somebody to give you a piggyback in faith. But at some stage, you've got to have your own. And that's where I'm getting to. So don't pick up any condemnation. We're totally for you. But it's time to grow up 
is time to mature in the things of God and how to have faith. But God has got a plan to develop you and your own faith. And this means you're gonna you're gonna you you're gonna have to learn what faith is and how to operate in that faith. And so I'm here to help us with that. For, for some of you, the challenge is to, to be in faith for others. You know what it is to have faith, but it's always for you. It's always about what you can get. And that's not wrong. That's not wrong. But it, but you're used to, oh, God, just, just sort this out. Just help me with this business. Just help me, uh, you know, with this relationship or whatever. And that's all good. But it's time to move on now for others. Having faith to see others. Miracles of healing for others. Miracles of healing of mental torments. That is so prevalent in our nation. Well, in the Western world, mental torments. That's not, I'm not talking about evil spirits. I'm just talking about mental torments and being healed from them. How many people would just love to have those torments just taken off their minds? They have no peace of mind. It's like work every day and it's painful work in your mind to be able to pray in the name of Jesus and lift it off. Let God put his super on your natural. You put your hand on their mind, on their head, and God puts his hand on your hand. And all of a sudden, their mental torments are dissolved. It's time we stepped out in faith to them that never come to our church and bring healing where we go. For others, it's deliverance from oppressive evil spirits. How, how do you command us an evil spirit to come out? We command them, you know, I've done loads, of, done, I've trained people, and there's a way to do all this. For supernatural debt cancellation, how do you help people find supernatural debt cancellation? That's all part of the gospel. Financial breakthroughs, uh, you know, all for other people. So you're, faith, you're moving from faith to faith. What's happened in you, you so want it to happen in other people's lives. One thing you'll find when discovering how faith operates is that faith operates in a time zone that's now. So remember when I was saying right at the beginning, now faith is, is the substance of, so it's now faith is a substance of things not seen. Now faith. Faith is now. <coughs> faith is not about the future. For instance, you can't say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be healed and be in faith. It's, it's like, no, I am healed. The symptoms are still there. Everything's still going wrong. But the Bible says this, by his stripes, we were healed. By his stripes, we were, past tense, by the stripes that Jesus had when they whipped his back. By his stripes, we were healed. And so we believe that. Um, um, and I know it's a con controversial thing. I understand that. I've, I've seen so many people healed by using that verse. And I've, I've seen people who have prayed for and they've not been healed. And we've got to leave that sometimes just to the mystery of God, because I'm past trying to find the thing out. I, 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 you know, I try to work it out and I can't work it out. Uh, all I know is that anybody that Jesus came into contact with that needed healing in terms of asking him, he did. And uh, I'm sure he passed many, many people that were infirm and that, were, that needed healing and they didn't get healed because he was on the move. And it wasn't that he was callous, he was just on the move. Um, but for us, we have to learn how to bring healing. And when a person's been healed supernaturally, often the symptoms come back and then they lose the healing. So how do you stop that from happening? Because the devil's a liar and he's a robber. And he gives you all the same symptoms back and says, see, you weren't healed. And we all go, oh yeah. And we believe what we see and what we hear from the doctors and everything, we believe all that. And then it remains with us. So we can do that, that doesn't take faith. Or we can do the opposite, we can have faith and say, no, by stripes I'm healed. And whatever it is that's attacking your body, you can say, I'm healed, you've got to leave. You've got to leave. I'm healed, by stripes I'm healed. Can you see how illogical the gospel is? But when you start to see it working in your life, when God's super comes on your natural, you're like, I never thought, I was so sceptical, I was so this, I was so that. So I'm just saying, I'm taking us through. And uh, I want you to be teachable. I want you to get hold of this stuff because it'll blow you away really well. So the Bible says, let the weak say I am strong. It doesn't say wait till you're strong. It says, 
Let the weak say, I am strong. Why? Because you, you're setting your sail. You're saying, that's where I'm going. When you keep saying, well, I'm weak, I'm weak, oh, I'm pathetic. That's all. That, you just get weaker and weaker. But you've got to start to speak some things out in faith. Let the weak say, I am strong. You know, Abraham in the Old Testament, Abraham, spelled A-B-R-A-M, means, I have it somewhere, oh yeah, exalted father. But he wasn't a father, he'd no kids. And him and his wife couldn't have kids. And uh, it wasn't until he was 100 and his wife was 90 that they, they had a child uh, with each other. And But before that happened, the, God changed the names. And he changed Abraham to Abraham. And Abraham means the father of multitudes. And he had to hear his wife shout across, father of multitudes, your dinner's ready. Father of multitudes. That's what Abraham means. And he kept hearing it father of multi she kept saying it and speaking it out and faith was birth faith comes by hearing the word i'm going to talk talk about this in a minute but so so they started to speak things out and then they had the first baby this is these are the principles of faith simon in the bible uh, we know him now as peter he had the foot and mouth disease if you remember him he always puts his you know you, you know start speaking before he engages his brain puts his foot in, in it constantly Jesus came upon Simon. Simon means a reed. And reeds are just blown about. And he looked at Simon and he said, from now on, you're going to be called Peter, which is Cephas in their language, but Peter. And he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So he calls Peter rocky. You know, like a rock that can't, can't move. It's like, you are solid as a rock. You are stable. You are unmovable. Peter wasn't, <laughs> but Jesus has got the box lid on the jigsaw and he speaks to him from his future and he says, you are the rock. I wonder if that's what Jesus wants to say to somebody here today. I'm going to build something great on your life. People say you're flimsy, you're flaky, you're this, but I see what's in your heart. And even you say, well, I find that very difficult. No, 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 put faith in his word. I'm speaking his word to you today. Your job is to get hold of it and believe it, and you'll see the transformation. Simon means, means read, Peter means rock. So being in faith starts now, and its manifestation, it becomes real as we go, but it is now. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things that we hope for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So how do you get this conviction and confirmation of the reality of faith? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's not just hearing anything, it's hearing God's word. And here's a great example of this. Let me play it out for you. Let me give you a, a little video from the Bible, a word video. So he says this in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. He says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered or respected the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, By the way, her two boys were a retirement fund as well. So she's lost her husband. She's about to lose her two sons. And they reckon, scholars reckon that her husband got into debt by doing good work for God. And that can happen, you know. And he got into debt because they reckon he protected a lot of them prophets and hid them from an evil king, a weak king called Ahab, who was dominated by his wife Jezebel. And she was bloodthirsty as they come. And she hated the prophets. She loved the false prophets and she hated God's prophets who spoke the truth. There's always been many religions, but there's only one true faith. There is only one true religion. They can't all be right because they contradict themselves, contradict each other. And these prophets were very bold in speaking God's word. And so she tried to have them murdered. And it looks like this guy protected them, borrowed money to feed them and clothe them. And he just died. And he's left a wife and two kids. And now the creditors are coming saying, your husband orders money. You have no money, never mind, we'll take your kids. 
And so she cries out to Elisha and Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? He's engaging her, trying to get her to think. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said. She's so despondent. I've got nothing, absolutely nothing. Then she thought, except, except a small jar of olive oil. So he's like, it's pathetic. Just accept a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbours for empty jars. He gives us something to do. Go around and ask all your neighbours for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all of the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him. And she shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Notice the oil only stopped when she ran out of vessels, of jars. God was willing to give more. He's always a God of plenty. Verse seven, she said, it says, she went and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. I love this because she can't see in the invisible. And when the man of God comes and he's preaching God's word to her, she believes his word. What God knows is there in the invisible can come to her. She just had a jar of oil left to logic. And the principles of this life and this world and what your parents, how your parents bring you up and stuff like that is not going to get any more oil in, in the, you know, from that jar. But as, as you listen to the man of God and, and step out in faith on what he says, then, you, you, you know, that oil can multiply. And this is what I want to get us to, that God can multiply things. He can increase because it's his will for your life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, after he made Adam and Eve. He said, I've given you all this. Now go and multiply and increase and take dominion over everything. Be responsible for everything. Grow it. Increase it. In Isaiah 54, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. This is a good one for you as business people. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out to the left and to the right. And uh, stretch it, you, you know, loosen your cords lengthen your cords, I should say, and strengthen your stakes, you will spread out to the right and to the left. And, you know, that's a message for somebody today. Lockdown has, has caused you to think like this, and God says, no, do the opposite. In fact, it starts out, sing, or barren woman, you who never bore a child, because more of the children are, are of the barren woman than those who give birth. And what God was saying is, do the opposite of what you would do if you were barren. Barren people don't want to sing and be happy because they're sad that they can't have children. And God says, sing, O barren woman. Do the opposite. He's, he's, he's calling her to do something. You see, when, when we turn, oh God, can you just, he has to do something. He doesn't tell her to pray, he tells her to sing. Praying leaves the responsibility with God to do something. Singing causes the atmosphere to change and, and creates an atmosphere for God to do miracles. Single barren woman, it's a, it's a step of faith. What instruction have you heard from me over these few months? You maybe you've been joining us recently. What instruction? Just listen to some of the things that I'm saying. Like Dave said this. And it might not just be Dave. It might be God speaking through Dave. Can you see what I'm saying? I hope it is. That's the whole point of me preaching. <laughs> not everything I say is going to be relevant to you. You just take your portion and you believe it. And you see, we heard a story that the other week by Matt and Nikki Alton about having a baby and they couldn't conceive. And what she didn't tell you, and I wish she had it done because it would have encouraged some of you. Because I, I had said to them, you know, in 12 months, you're going to have uh, a baby. I, I might have even said a boy, she had a girl. <laughs> but in 12 months, you're going to have a baby. And was, I, I didn't know how impossible it was, to be honest with you, but it was impossible. And God opened up a way. And now we've got baby Grace. You know, a few years ago, 
I pray for another lady in the church who her and her husband have been trying for three years. And, uh, and I didn't pray, actually. I spoke to her belly and I commanded it to conceive in the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, in 10 months, you'll have a baby boy. And in nine months, you had a baby boy. <laughs> Little Billy. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. And God speaks through the man of God. And he, and he speaks through his preachers and his, his teachers. And so get all of some of these things. Now, you, you listen to this story. This story is absolutely fabulous. Because a prophet's job or a man of God's job is to bring instruction or tell them to do something. To give them something to believe or give them something to do. And and, and so, you know, I, I gave uh, two women and their husbands something to believe and both couples conceived. And with, in this story, he gives us something to do. He says, go and do this, that and the other. I remember businesses. We have so many businesses that have started in our church. And often I will go, now it's not just me going, it's the people that I have influenced and, and they've, they've took on what I've said and all of a sudden it's become true. God's put the super on the natural and, you know, the businesses have, have started and then the businesses have boomed. Now they're telling others and what's on me comes on to them, what's on them comes on to others. That's how it's meant to work. I told you last week about Christ being the anointed one and now he's got lots of Christians believing in him and we should take what he has and go and spread it around the world. He who believes in me, Jesus says, John 14, he who believes in me will do these works and greater things shall he do because I go back to the Father. As Jesus went back to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit onto his church. Come on, somebody, this is fantastic. So we're meant to be like little Jesus is taking the good news out, speaking God's word, giving people direction and, and giving people something to believe so that they can uh, see the super come on their natural. So I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you these principles. This woman heard what the man of God said and just did it. It was illogical, but she did it. And she went in and closed the doors and did it behind closed doors. You don't have to do everything publicly. You know, there's some, some people, you know, everyone has to know and you either fail or succeed. And it's like, you don't have to do everything publicly, but you know, this woman went behind closed doors and God did the miracle. And how they must have felt paying off them debts. What a genius we follow. He knows where everything is in this world. And he can get stuff to us if we'll only believe. This is the heart of what I'm trying to say. And you know, how, how, do, you, how do we have this faith? I'm giving you principles, but it's really the same way that you become a Christian. You hear a message, you believe it. And you start to receive it. And, and the more that, that you, you, you open yourself up to it, the more it becomes real to you. And now, you know, you know that you're forgiven. One of the best tests of, of knowing whether you're a Christian or not is doubt. You know, before you were a Christian, you had no doubt about faith because you didn't believe. When you become a Christian, then you start to doubt. And you think, am I really a Christian? You never thought like that years back. The answer would have been, maybe, I don't know. Now it concerns you. Why? Because you think you are. Because you've been believing. So I just, just want to encourage you and uh, keep encouraging you into faith. I'm just trying to move out because I'm trying to see what my time is. I'm running out of time. I can't believe so much time has gone past so quickly. So one last scripture before we finish. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. People that are sent to bring good news. And uh, I want to say that I'm sent. I told you earlier, I was called out of my job and uh, out of the factory. And I was called to Bible college. And, you know, down the years, I am called, I have been sent by God to bring his message to nations. And that's what I want to do. And uh, I'm sent to you. I spend time in God's word because I can. And so God's word is in me. I prepare talks for you because I've got the time. And most of you don't have the time because you're working. So when I speak, you can take the portion that you need and use it 
to benefit yourself and others. You can believe the bit, thinking that really spoke to me today. That really hit my life today. Usually the way I visit my church is to instruct and impart the wisdom that God's word speaks about. I do it through my preaching and teaching. Rather than speaking to one person, a preach can cancel or give direction or revelation. Uh, uh, re um, uh, yeah, revelation or relevant teaching to all the churches. Preach can do it rather than just going from one to one to one. We can all hear it and benefit from it. And the things that are not relevant to our lives we leave, but the things that are, we say, wow, I didn't know Dave was going to speak on this today. This has hit my life. And so my job is to give you the word. Your job is to receive the word, believe it, and to act on it. I've run out of time. We always give people an opportunity at the end of uh, every, every preach to give their life to Jesus Christ. If that's you today, we invite you to bow your heads and repeat this prayer in your heart. Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I believe that he rose again, that he conquered death, he paid the price for all my sins. I receive his forgiveness here and now. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Put the super on my natural and give me the assurance that I'm right with you. Amen. If you've said that prayer, please get in touch with us and let us know we can send you some helpful literature. And for others that are listening, remember we're planting churches, uh, you know, making disciples, planting churches and reaching cities with the gospel. Come and get involved. And maybe you've been disillusioned with church and you've fallen out. You know, it's time to grow up. It's time to reconnect. It's time to say, you know what? I spat my dummy out, but I'm coming back. I don't mean to be offensive, but you know, we haven't got a lot of time to tie it up. Let's get back on and let's get going again. If that's you, get in touch, sign up. <laughs> All right, have a great week and I'll see you next week.